Ever wonder how to stand strong when you're dealing with someone who clearly has the upper hand? Well, I sat down with Rebecca Zung, a top 1% attorney who's had to negotiate with her fair share of difficult people. And here's what we got coming up. What is the best way for those of us who are not comfortable with negotiation to reprogram our mind to start thinking about the right way to approach it? I think the one thing that you have to understand is that people will think what you tell them to think. I've never heard of this covert narcissist term. Do you think this is quite common? Very common. It's like a way of bullying. What are the signs or the symptoms that you are working with a narcissist? They do things very underhandedly. There's always this sort of element of plausible deniability. You can't really tie things back to them. Welcome to The Mark Drager Show, where we explore the minds and stories of extraordinary entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. In your experience with everything that you've done, what is the best way for those of us who are not comfortable with negotiation to reprogram our mind to start thinking about the right way to approach it? I think the one thing that you have to understand is that people will think what you tell them to think. You know, and that was really one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is that people will think what you tell them to think. And how I learned that is, and you know, I'm going to start there because I think, you know, it, it comes from a place of knowing who you are, knowing your value, understanding authentic power versus counterfeit power. And, and that kind of is a good place to understand true authentic power, right? But you know, when you're dealing with somebody who is confident and truly knows who they are and you feel it before they even open their mouth. And that has a lot to do with body language, which I know a lot about too. But, you know, when you know who you are and you're walking into a room and you're standing there and, you know, it's an air, it's, it's not, and it's not pretentious and it's not, but there's so much that is said about everything when, when, you know, people will think what you tell them to think. And I can tell you a story that is so powerful for me. It was so pivotal in my life too. When I was, I had practiced law for maybe eight years, and then I went to. I had a little child at the t- at the time, and I decided to go be a like a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley for a little while. And I had my Series 7, my 66. And I joined this kind of big wealth advisory team there because I thought it would be a more, I don't know, family-friendly lifestyle for my... At the time, I had a little child who was not. It was not a more family-friendly lifestyle. But, it, you know, so I did that for a couple of years. And then I had a friend who had a small law practice, maybe a dozen clients or so. And she was leaving town. It was, a you know, Naples, Florida, which is a very affluent little town in Florida. And she said, I'm leaving town, but I have this little law practice. If you want it, I'm going to give it to you. And, you know, I thought, well, nobody's ever going to dump a law practice in my lap ever. And here's a chance for me to start my own practice. So I decided to go back into practicing law. At the time, I hired a business coach who is still my business coach off and on and one of my best friends and most trusted advisors. And I said to her, I am so afraid. I was so fearful of many things, many things at the time. But one of them was I was so afraid that the people of Naples, Florida, the professional community, the people, everybody was going to think I was a total flake. Uh, She was a lawyer. Now she's a financial advisor, back to being a lawyer. This girl does not know what she wants. She's such a flake. What the hell? You know, and she said... People will think what you tell them to think. She said, you can tell them to think that you're a flake. Or you can tell them to think that you are the only attorney that has a financial background. 
So you are actually more qualified than any other family law attorney in town. Which story would you like to tell? And so I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, early in my career, I was like 21 or 22. I was working for an entrepreneur, uh, pretty successful. I mean, there was like two, 300 people on staff. And I was working with him closely. And I noticed that he was able to take anything people said, turn it around and reposition it. And then later I heard this thing called spin selling, like this idea yeah. of like, like you can just, you can just take it and spin it and like work it into the story. And I love that story you just shared because it perfectly illustrates that your greatest weaknesses are also your greatest strengths. Your greatest strengths are also your greatest weaknesses in the right context. And it's really our job to just be like, how do we flip it? Exactly. And so I decided to go with that. And, you know, and I really decided I'm positioning myself as a high net worth family law attorney and I am, the, the, I only take big cases. And I, and so within a couple of years, I was representing Arnold Schwarzenegger's goddaughter and I was traveling with him in Europe and I was representing, you know, the guy who founded melting pot restaurants and all of these massive, huge clients, people who very clearly were not going to hire a flake. But had I been apologetic, had I positioned myself like, I'm so sorry, I'm definitely a flake, you know, that's how people would have seen me. That is how people would have seen me. Hmm. So definitely people will think what you tell them to think. A few a few questions on this, if I can. Did, did you grow up around money, from money, come from money? Or was this a bit of a transition to work with high net worth people? Um, yes and no. I'm going to say... People would say that I did come from money in the sense that my father was an anesthesiologist. My, I'm, I'm half Chinese and half German. I would say I have no fun genes whatsoever. Um, but, uh, but he came from, you know, they came over on a boat like from China, you know, and they were immigrants. They came from nothing, you know, and. They very much, my grandfather came from, they worked hard. They, they came to this country and came from the ground up. I mean, my, yeah, my dad went to Ivy League. He went to Columbia in New York City, but like on scholarship and they literally came from nothing. And so I'm going to say from the outside, yeah, it looks like I came from money, but I, I was always very well aware because I'm first generation that it didn't just come from the air. You know, I yeah. mean, that yeah, we, that, that we, immigrant mentality was like, and, and that need to make sure that you are, you are respecting the amount of effort and work that your parents put into establishing you guys. For sure. And then even on my mom's side too, um, her, my grandparents were from Germany and they came over and they started this glass factory in, in Pennsylvania, which is still there, by the way. And, you know, so there is a very much an immigrant mentality, you know? So I'm going to say my family had, you know, we weren't wealthy by any means, but we were fine. And, but it was all very much work hard, you earn it. And I mean, we weren't spoiled at all. That's for sure. And so when you took over this practice and you know, you've been practicing law for eight years, you'd stepped out and did some financial planning and now you're back again. Uh, was there a bit of an adjustment that you had to make being surrounded by high net worth individuals in terms of what they value and what they think? And were there any lessons that really stick out at you at that time? Oh, for sure. I mean, even when I first started on my own, I was not charging enough per hour. I mean, I, I was actually charging too low of an amount. And the guy who I ended up merging my practice with a few years ago, who, you know, because I don't practice anymore. So he was my law partner for the last several years. He, the reason why he became my law partner ultimately was because he took care of me and you know he stopped by my office one day and he 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 was just you know my receptionist said jack long is here to see you and i was like well okay so i came out and 
he's this older guy and he's so great. He's from New York. And he says, I want to talk to you about your hourly rate. And I said, okay. And he said, it's too low. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, I'm afraid if I make it too, too high, I'm not going to get any clients. You know, I was very much just starting this practice at that time. And he said, I'm going to tell you a story. When I first started on my own, I did a divorce for a guy. He said, at the end of the divorce, the guy said to me, you charged me, you did a great job for me, Jack. You charged me $4,000. My wife's attorney charged her $5,000. And Jack's like, okay, so you should be happy. And the guy said to him, I guess uh, her lawyer must be better than you. He charged her more. So the moral of the story was the guy surmised that because she charged more, he's better. So he stood up and he turned around and he said to me, raise your damn rates. And he went to hell. People assume like because you're charging more that you're better. Um, so the very next day he called me and he was referring a case to me actually happened to be that one Arnold Schwarzenegger's goddaughter because he had a conflict. Are you allowed to talk about this stuff? Is there no like client privilege here or anything? Oh, no, it's all, um, you know, it was public. It was public, you know, it, it was in the, um, you know, filed in the public uh, domain public you know. record and all that uh, stuff. yeah these things are public so he ended up ha- having a conflict so he calls me and he says i'm giving you a case it's a great case you know they've got money you know whatever and he says as he's hanging up he says and by the way they have money so charge something decent for god's sake <laughs> So he made me step into my value. He made me step into my power and step into my value. And I very much am always going to be in such gratitude for him about that. That's such a great story because I'm always fascinated between the overlap of, um, I guess, gift and skill and craft and then, and then business. You know, if we have someone who's a performer, an actor, a singer, a comedian, or whatnot on the podcast, or if we have a business person, um, I'm always interested in 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 how that works because you developing your craft as a lawyer, uh, as a, a negotiator, now moving into obviously you've written I think four books, and uh, you know you're really high sought after in terms of in terms of teaching and learning and speaking. That's like the craft. But then there's the business side of things like how do we position it? How do we market it? How do we sell it? How do we have confidence in these moves we're going to make? And in my experience, lawyers, accountants, um, doctors, physicians, like people who spend a lot of time on their craft usually are pretty bad business people. Oh, yeah, <laughs> has, for sure. Has that been your experience? <laughs> for sure. Well, they don't teach anything like that in law school or, you know, I'm sure medical school either. But, you know, it then it did finally get to a point where I had so much work that I was, there was no negotiation for me in my fee or anything like that. You know, I, I did finally get to a point where I had enough confidence in myself because, you know, confidence definitely comes from success from the doing from leaning into your fear and seeing that you can do it and and it it, it doesn't come from the planning and the looking at it on the paper and you know it, it definitely comes from getting beat up and being in the arena there's no doubt about it i i i, I think and, and so i mean i know for me Eventually, I I definitely got to a point where, in my practice, where I was, you know, no, there's no negotiation. You you want to go to the guy down the street? Fine, have fun. It's fine with me, you know. And but then that makes you so much more 
sought after when once you get to that point. Do you think there's any way to shortcut that? Can you can you skip ahead to that point and just start to front and put out there, or or you think you got to ladder your way up? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it happened very rapidly for me. It, it definitely did. I, it, and it did in this business too. I think it has a lot to do with your thoughts and quantum physics as well. And, and how you think about and what, what you, the energy that you put out into the universe. And I think the universe meets that vibrational energy too. I think there's, what does that part, mean? you know, I think like attracts like. And I do believe that the the universe wants you to have what you want. And I think that once you create an intention that if you if you if you're pretty laser focused in what that intention is and you meet that with the right energy and you meet that with the right emotion. And you you understand that. I do think that you can make things happen for you fairly quickly and you can manifest fairly quickly. But that's probably a whole different conversation. <laughs> I, I, I hear, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm just wondering if you're uncomfortable speaking about it or not. <laughs> no, I just didn't know if you were. <laughs> oh, we're both tiptoeing around the woo-woo side of things, are we? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not uncomfortable with it, but I just didn't know if you were. But I think that that's a whole other conversation. But I think that that's part of it, too. I think that's mm. part of it, too. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's all... I think it's all wrapped up together. And so how did you make that transition then from law to you know, the many books you've put out and and you do have a a book coming out um, in October that we, that I'd love to be able to speak to you about, but, but how did you make that transition? You said it happened very quickly. You mean the transition from law to what I'm doing now? Yeah. Um, Well, that transition, I mean, the, the, the business I'm in now took off fairly quickly, but the transition didn't happen as quickly. I mean, what happened was I, I had written one book in 2013, which was Breaking Free, a step-by-step divorce guide. And I continued to practice law after that. But that book did sort of catapult me into starting to do some television work and some other things. I started to do some, some, you know, interviews and things like that. And um, I started to sort of be like the on-call person for like extra and TMZ, like when, when divorces would break, they would call on me to, you know, comment on, you know, Brad and Angelina or Miley and, you know, um, Liam or what, whoever. What, what, would, what would a, what would a TMZ slash, you know, entertainment tonight take be like, they, they give you 20 seconds to just say, I think this is the issue. Like, how does that look? Correct. Yes. You know, um, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with your divorce? What's going to happen with Tom and Katie? Um, what's going to happen with, um, you know, in, in court? Or, or, um, or, uh, what's going to happen with the custody situation between Brad and Angelina? You know, um, uh, they they just ordered a custody evaluation. What does this mean? Gonna, fun. Was it was it fun? Oh, it was super fun. Super fun. Did, did, did you like? Was that like the greatest media training in the world? Like suddenly, you know, you're like you're on camera, you're remote, and you're just you're just doing your quick segments or what? Yeah, I loved it. You know, it kind of gave me an insight into. Well, maybe I don't necessarily want to just practice law all the time, you know, and that actually kind of was my foray into thinking maybe I want to do something else. But it, my clients were like, Oh, that's great that you're on television or whatever, but what are you doing on my case? You know, they didn't really, they, they, they kind of liked it, but then they also wanted to know what I was doing for their case. And I started to get this feeling like I was on this hamster wheel all the time. I enjoyed 
the process of creating the business, I didn't necessarily enjoy the hamster wheel phase of the business. I really started to understand more about myself that I'm more of a creative, not necessarily the keep it going. I I hear you. I hear you. You know, and I I've re- I've realized that myself for the last year and a half that I'm a builder. I hate maintenance. Like the yeah. amount of work and time it takes to an effort just to keep things where they were so they're not eroding and moving backwards that is but building things is like so much fun because you're like you're like putting it all together and it's new and it's fresh and you're learning things constantly and then the maintaining is like oh gosh yeah it just was not so much fun for me every day of the all the employees i had a lot of employees and the 401k you know audits or the air conditioner was down today and just all of that was just not fun for me it was really a drag and my daughter was just starting high school and i really wanted to spend time with her and i just wasn't able to do that because i didn't really have much of a personal life so i just didn't really want to continue with that anymore so i just decided to go ahead and merge my practice with two other guys. And my husband had always wanted to get back to California. He had lived out here between college and law school. And we met in law school, actually. So I'd actually had three kids before I was 22. I got married at 19 the first time. Wow. You beat me and my wife. That is... She was 21. I was 22. That's rare. (laughs) I know. And then we got divorced, my first husband and I. And... I met my husband in law school when I was still in my 20s, you know. So we've been married for 23 years. And and then our daughter, our youngest is ours together. And she was just starting high school and doing a lot of theater and modeling, so she was up for the whole LA experience. And I I just thought, you know, this is a chance to ha- create space and have some air and breathe and it it worked for me. So I was traveling back to Florida like a week a month to just practice part-time at the time. So this was like six years ago now. Then I started doing some entrepreneurial endeavors. And in one of them, I ended up with a person who turned out to be a covert narcissist. And that caused a lot of pain and drama, trauma and chaos in my life. What what are the signs or the symptoms or how do you know that you are with working with uh, a narcissist? Well, I did not know what a covert narcissist was. It's very different than a regular narcissist. A covert narcissist on the surface seems to be really lovely and warm and kind and everybody else loves this person. But they're more passive aggressive. They do things very underhandedly. They, you know, I... It, there's always this sort of element of plausible deniability, meaning that you you can't really tie things back to them because there's always this sort of innocence about what they did, you know, such as inadvertently leaving you off an email. Oh, I didn't put you on that. I'm so sorry. I Oh, and so they're having a business meeting without you. And, you know, um, agreeing to do something within the business and then just not doing it. And, you know, so you're kind of nagging them to do it, but then you just end up doing it yourself. Or, you know, didn't put money in the bank account because they just claim they couldn't figure out how to do it, but they're going to transfer it back into the account. And then they just never do. And you just kind of end up having to try to It's just all sorts of little things like that. And they add up and add up and add up. Little passive aggressive things that are said, like, I can't, what's the name of your book again? I can't remember. You know, you know, like it just goes on and on and on. And so you just end up feeling every time you're around them, you just end up feeling like crap all the time, all the time. You know, I've heard of this, this covert narcissist term is, do you think this is quite common? Very common. 
very common. It's, it's it's like a way of bullying, you know. Oh, oh, I just I happened to talk to this person um this morning. Oh, you know, I'm becoming better friends with this person, you know. I like they they kind of make it seem like they're closer to this person than you are and and you know, sort of isolating you away from you know, so you sort of feel like something's going on without you. And you know, just like like that, it's it, you're it's a, it's a psychological sort of game mm-hmm. that they're constantly playing, um, taking your content and putting it on their social media, stealing your quotes, and you know that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a game constantly. Um, you know. Um, so how did you break? How did you break free of, oh, it was of this pure hell. jerk? Pure hell. Pure hell. Pure hell. Um, now, now well, I have to ask: Did any of your your background as a lawyer? I mean, that must have come in handy. And yeah, your yeah. ability to try and detach yourself and negotiate through this. This like, or did you just pull the pin and be like, "Screw it, let's burn this thing to the ground"? Well, so what happened with me is that um, I went on vacation with my family in July of 19. And I'd only been in this relationship for like a year or something. But I went to Maui, which now I see Maui and I think so sad. But I go, I went to Mount Haleakala with my daughter and my husband. And I was at the top and it was at sunrise and it's so beautiful up there. And I, my daughter, who was 17 at the time, was like, mom, it's, Oh my gosh, it's like, it's heaven on earth. It's so amazing. And I'm up there and it's heaven on earth. And I'm there with my daughter and my husband and it's so beautiful. And what am I thinking of at that moment? I'm thinking of that freaking horrible person, right? And I thought, no, you do not get to be here and heaven in our, on earth. Like, no. It's like one thing to ruminate, at, you know, at my house or whatever. You don't get to be here in heaven on earth. And it was at that moment that I had this sort of aha moment that I thought, this is not okay. I'm allowing myself to be a victim. Every time I give this person space in my head, I'm giving, I'm in victim mode. And that was my aha moment. I thought, I'm I'm done. This is done. I'm done with this. And so the person that walked up that mountain was not the same person who walked down. I I thought, I'm out of this relationship. I'm telling her I'm done. And I'm going to finish my book, Negotiate Like You Matter, which is here. And I, I thought, I'm, you know, this is it. So I finished the book, Negotiate Like You Matter. I sent it out for endorsements. One of the people who wrote back right away was Robert Shapiro, who I didn't even know. And he says, call me. I'm like, oh, okay. So I called him. I literally was speaking to him that afternoon and he offered to write the foreword. Uh, and so he did. He wrote the foreword and magic started to happen. So then after that, I started finding out about covert passive aggressive narcissism. And I, at the time, I was also learning about funnels. I was learning about the YouTube algorithm. I was teaching it to myself. I was learning about how to do keywords, how to do search suggested. You know, I was teaching myself the whole YouTube alg- algorithm and I was starting to do videos just on negotiation in general, like, you know, clothing color and negotiation, how to do, get a job or what, you know, things like that. Right. I, I was getting like 30 views, you know, my mom and her church friends, literally, that's it. Like, oh, you know, I, I watched your video. It was so good. All my church friends watched it. I'm like, oh, thank you. So, um, so in January of 2020, I literally had like 300 subscribers on my channel at that point. Uh, I did one video on how to negotiate with a narcissist. And I thought, all right, 
This is the thing. I'm, I'm going to do a course on how to negotiate with a narcissist. So I came up with slay, which is strategy, leverage, anticipate, and you. And I'm going to have it go live on March 11th. <laughs> March 11th, 2020. The reason I'm laughing is because I know March 12th, 2020 was the uh, the day that my agency lost 70% of its revenue. Well, what happened What happened around March 11th, 12th, and 13th well, of 2020? I, yeah, this is back in January <laughs> because I, no, I, I had no idea what was going to happen in the world. But I knew March 11th was the day after the... Um, Mercury retrograde. So I looked at the calendar and I'm like, okay, when is Mercury retrograde going to be over? And I picked that day. Why does that matter? Nothing about COVID. I don't don't know what that means. Well, just, you know, like right when Mercury's in retrograde, it's not like it's like bad days for signing contracts. It's like the world is like uh, uh, off, right? So I thought, okay, I'm picking. The world was off. The world is off. So I was like, okay, I'm picking March 11th. So I go live with it and I had like, I think I I had like 46 people on my webinar or something. Three must have secrets to communicating with a narcissist or something. And I, I sold it and I have still, I still use that webinar, by the way. I have. Can, can I just can I just stop for a second and just point out something really cool? So, you mentioned the fact that you you know you jumped into content production and you're producing these YouTube videos and you're getting the 30 views from your mom and the church friends and all that stuff. But then this one topic that you happen to put out gets 700 views, and then you recognize that, and then you're able to build the course and start to build off that. It reminds me actually of I don't know if you've read Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules Mm-mm. to to Life, but he he mentions in the opening the fact that. You know, he used to be on core answering questions and he would just answer questions. But there was this one thing, this one post, this one thing that he put out there that seemed to get more attention than anything else. And it seemed like people liked it and it seemed like they were interested in it. And that was literally the thing that that was the foundation of the book. That's the foundation of 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 all the work that he started to do. And it's like, I love that you that you were doing something. You noticed it got a little bit of interest or lift and you're like, let's see where this goes. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for saying that. And and so what I did was I had a lead magnet in my videos, which led to a, an email sequence. And the email sequence led to a free webinar, and which I did live for years, which now leads to an evergreen, which still makes me over seven figures a year, by the way. And... I went from 300 subscribers to over a hundred thousand in 10 months. So just because I decided to concentrate a niche down. And so now I have like 40 million views on YouTube, something like that. And I've made, oh, I don't know, probably five million dollars. I mean, at least on that one webinar. Why is negotiation or narcissism or this magical mix of the two of them? Why is this such a popular topic? Well, it's 15% of the population. 15% of the population is either... I mean, narcissistic personality disorder itself is something like 6% of the population. But then if you lump in personality disorders that lack empathy like antisocial personality disorder, bipolar personalities, or other other personality disorders that lack empathy, it's like up to 15% of the population. And if each one of those people emotionally abuses just three people in their lifetimes, now we're talking 158 million Americans or 3.4 billion people on the planet. That's, you know, like half the population. So everybody's been affected by somebody at some point in their lives. So I think it's that, you know, I think everybody has had to deal with someone at some, at some point. And, and, you know, whether it's a family member, a boss, a colleague, a neighbor, uh, you know, and, and I think 
why my content has blown up is because I'm not just talking about who or what is this person. I'm talking about or processing your feelings. I'm talking about here's what to do. Uh, he, you know, uh, here's how to negotiate. Here's how to communicate. Here's here, you know, from a very, very practical standpoint. And so as you're approaching negotiations, um, there are different types of personalities. I imagine there's people who are more, uh, you know, if we go through the breakdown, actually disagree, disagree. What, what term am I looking for? How disagreeable you are. Disagreeableness, I suppose, is, you know, the one's willingness to just not care how much you disagree with others. Uh, those who are more open to, to conflict, those who are more of bullies, let's say, or, or other things like that. So when you approach a negotiation, what is what is the how do you feel things out? How do you know what you're up against? Do you, do you got to kind of have to wait and see or do you prep for things or, or how do you deal with these? You mean if you're dealing with a high conflict personality? Well, before I think you I mean, d- does one even know if you're dealing with a high conflict personality before you start the negotiating process? Or um, like, like, how do we understand if, if I have to go through, let's say, um, if I have to go through a divorce or a custody, or I'm fighting with my business partner, or, you know, maybe even something more mon- mundane, you know, I'm negotiating, the, you know, a new car that I'm purchasing, or um, terms on a lease or whatever it might be. How do we just approach negotiations before we even understand if we're up against that narcissist or that that high conflict personality? Well, I think you know it, that's a, a pretty broad question because I'm going to just say that most of the time you're going to know if you're going to be dealing with a high conflict personality because if you're you, you, you know in a divorce or a business partnership or something like that, you already know who the personality type, you you know, I mean, or if it's a a colleague or somebody like that, it's a person that you've already been dealing with for a while, you know, unless it's a new boss or a new somebody that you've never met before, then, you know, then you're not going to know. I mean, I guess if it's, Somebody that, you know, you've not ever been in like a a new car or a something like that, then you're not going to know. But for the most part, if you if if in your past interactions, you've either seen them be aggressive or you've noticed them be aggressive or manipulative or you come at it more of a, I I guess, more of a passive role in the relationship, then it's natural to assume that that they that they might take more of that conflict approach. Right. I mean, you're going to know who you're dealing with for the most part because you have a past relationship with them you, because they're that hot, cold, push, pull, manipulative personality. You know that you've been dealing with a person who is not an even person, who's not a reasonable person. And when you go into that discard phase, it is you do become public enemy number one. And they do want to take you down before you can take them down. They do want to make sure that it becomes war. And because they're afraid that you're going to expose them. So it does become a thing. Because with a narcissist, one of the things that I figured out, one of the things that I found in my research when I was doing the research for my book was that their brains are literally physiologically different than the brains of a non-narcissistic person in the sense that they have been, they were exposed to trauma when they were children. And when when what happens is humans, when we are exposed to trauma, is we go into fight or flight mode. And when we're in fight or flight, our brains emit chemicals. There's a chemical dump. Our our brains are bathed in chemicals so that we can pre- 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 prepare to you know either fight or flee. We, we you know we want to be stronger or faster, right? So it's. It's cortisol, it's epinephrine, it's adrenaline, right? Well, when that happens to children, 
on a continuous basis because they've been exposed to trauma many times. The limbic system part of their brain, the emotional center of the brain can become, there's arrested development that happens there. And so it's, it, it's actually called narcissistic injury. And so what happens is when they are presented with stimuli that causes them to feel like they are, you know, they have to go back into survival mode and it, it doesn't necessarily have to seem rational or reasonable to you, but it could be an eye roll. It could be a slight. It could be a, a tone. It could be anything. Then they feel like they need to go back into that survival mode again. And now, you know, they're not thinking rationally. They're not thinking reasonably. And now you're interacting with that. You're interacting with their Olympic system, whatever that means for them. It could be narcissistic rage. It could be whatever. But you're interacting with their limbic system. You're not interacting with the prefrontal cortex, which is the rational center of the brain at that point. And which means that they'll take themselves down to take you down. You're, you're interacting with, you know, basically a toddler sometimes. And so when you're going down to, to negotiate with them, you have to understand that that's what's happening. And so, so, so rationality doesn't work with irrational people. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And, and so they are completely driven by what is, is called narcissistic supply. You know, rational people are driven and motivated by incentivized by many different things. You know, it might be our children. It might be money. It might be peace of mind. You know, there's many different things that we want to, you know, maybe something we want to accomplish in our lives. You know, there's like many things that motivate us. They're completely motivated and incentivized by only one thing. It's this narcissistic supply. It's, you know, feeding this emptiness that's inside of them from external sources. And, and how they get that is, through what I call diamond level supply, which is how they look to the world, or coal level supply, which is degrading people or manipulating people. This is like, that's it. Those are the only two things. And so when you go to negotiate with them, the only way you can get them to stop manipulating you in the game of moving goalposts and, you know, making your life miserable is to threaten a source of supply that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from jerking you around. So most people think, oh, narcissists just want to win. Uh, what is it that they want? I'll just give it to them so I can be done with this thing. But that is not true. They enjoy the process of making you squirm. They enjoy the process of manipulating you. As you're describing that, that sounds... um I'm placing myself and imagining myself negotiating against this person or having to, having to be forced to deal with this person when I would much rather not. I would much rather not deal with it, back away, not fight. Like, And I think that might come from my past or, or what have you, but it just sounds scary. And... Most empaths feel exactly the way you do. Most okay. empaths do. Most empaths are like, I don't want to fight. I just want this thing to be over. I, and, and that is why they end up losing, <laughs> getting away with so much. Because somebody needs to stand up to the bully. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what we said at the beginning, which is stand in your power, stand in authentic power, because their power is all built on a house of cards. It's all built on this, this scarcity mentality, this fear-mongering mentality. You know what I, I always say? It's, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Christmas Story, but... Um, is, is, is that the one where they go back in time and whatnot? Or is this... No, they show like, it Are we talking every, Charles Dixon's the, the Christmas Story? Like, no, 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 no. This is a more of a recent movie. It's the one okay. um, where the kid wants the, the BB gun. I'll shoot your eye out. And... 
Um, they show it every year, uh, Christmas, like all day long on some, one of those shows, one, one of those channels. There's this bully that is in the movie and he's like bullying this kid every year, every day on his way home from school. And, you know, he, him and his brother and pushes him down in the snow. And, you know, and he's just like, one day he's just having a bad day. And he's like, so sick of this bully. And so he just fights back and he just is so, cause he's just so mad about all the things that is happening in his life. So he fights back and he just pushes the bully down and he beats on him. And after that, the bully is like so afraid of him and like completely just avoids him. And because really the bully was more afraid of him than he is, was of, uh, um, of him, you know what I mean? And I always say that the bullies are way more afraid of you than you are of them. Hmm. Like, but they don't, it's, it's a, they don't want you to know that. It goes, it goes back to you are whatever you show people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, I I believe you said that, you know, 80% of winning a negotiation happens, uh, you know, before you ever enter the room. Uh, why would that, why that, would that but, be? But then Bob Proctor corrected me and said 100%. <laughs> he corrected me on my own show. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I'm going to go into growth mentality mode. I will accept this correction, this public correction. Okay, so 100% Bob of Proctor. Win- <laughs> so I was like, okay, yes. <laughs> so 100% of winning a negotiation yes. happens before you ever enter the room. Why would that be? And how do you make sure that I want to win more negotiations? <laughs> Yes. Um, I, yeah, I mean, that's the why in Slay. That is you, your mentality. That is that it, it's the preparation and it's also your mindset. You, you know, there's so much in the mindset and there's also so much in the preparation and getting your leverage prepared and doing the documentation and doing the research and knowing what your uh, your offers are going to be ahead of time knowing what your risk assessment's going to be knowing what your walk away point i always say your choke point your vomit point whatever that is but you know knowing what your best case scenario is knowing what your worst case scenario is knowing what um all of that, because the more you can, uh, and knowing what their arguments are going to be, by the way, just as well, and and being able to present that, knowing what you're going to wear, knowing that you're going to feel confident, knowing even clothing color psychology, Back by the way, going back to that, your body language, knowing how to read your body language, knowing how, how to read theirs. There's so much that goes into that. Whose turf, your turf, their turf. You know, if you can have all of that mentally prepared ahead of time, then you're literally just executing it by the time you get there. So, so you, you do all of the work and then it's just about following the playbook depending on how they respond. Correct. Correct. You know, so so there's a few things. I've already declared that I hate negotiation. You've already said that I'm a bit of an empath and we just want these things over. Um, it's worth fighting for, right? Like often when I'm in a, a bit of a battle, and I have been, um, it, you know, I have to remind myself that it's that it's worth fighting for because I think by nature, I would just rather like just cut loose as quickly as possible and focus on the next thing to build. I, I think it just goes back to that risk assessment. Right. You know, I, I, many times I have said to my clients, yes, there is a price for freedom. You know, it's just how, how high of a price do you want to pay? You know, so it, it really is up to you. You know, a hundred percent, there's a price for mental health. I just had a, a, a one on one with a, a, a client this morning and had that conversation with her. And she was, you know, when you get into, it's the principle of the thing. Very bad, very bad, you know, reasoning for, well, I don't, you know, I don't want them to have it because it's the principle. It's the, it's my pride. It's, they just, it's not fair. You know, those are not good reasons. 
Those are not good reasons. But if, you know, if, if it really is money or, you know, there's other good reasons for it. Sure. You know, there just way out why you want to stand in, in, in holding fast to continuing to push, you know, how much do you want to die on a mountain? Right. But so it's always better to be more objective, less emotional and more pragmatic, I guess, in, in your approach. <laughs> I mean, I, those are all words I picked because I like those words. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely don't let them trigger you ever. So, so talk to me about Slay the Bully. So the new book comes out in October. Yes. Uh, and so, so tell me why. I mean, we've, we've already talked. The, the subline is how to negotiate with a narcissist and win. We've already covered some of this stuff, of course. But, but why this book? Uh, what went into it? What's your favorite part of it? So Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. I am so loving this book because I talk about what I was telling you about with the narcissist brain. I talk about also the person who comes to the table as a many times long-term target, victim, I don't know what word you want to use, who's been in a relationship with a narcissist, not just in a personal relationship, but oftentimes in a professional relationship, which I have been. And, you know, I, for example, a a friend of mine who was a physician at a very reputable hospital, I helped him through a very difficult negotiation who dealt with a lot of the same situation that I did to get out of that and moved to a a different hospital as a surgeon. He was a surgeon and went through a lot of the same traumas. You know, this is not just personal. This is also very much professional. So when those people have been in that kind of trauma, it's difficult for them to negotiate from a place of power because of the mental fog, the cognitive dissonance that they've been dealing with. And so I want them to understand what they've been dealing with. Then I walk through strategy, how to create strategy, how to create leverage, how to anticipate what a narcissist is going to do. And the reason why I love the A is because I walk through the different types of narcissists and how each negotiates in a different way so that you can't... Because that's so powerful. If you know you're dealing with a covert, they're going to de- negotiate differently. If you know you're getting dealing with a grandiose, they're going to negotiate differently. Same thing with a malignant. And, and I walk through... I give people scripts, plans, easy things that they can just use on on a dime, snap their fingers, print out, here's something, you know, so that it's easy stuff. It's not, you know, at the touch of a, 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 you know, um, at their fingers right away. And then um, the why is uh, you, your mindset, you creating a new life, creating a new beginning, creating a new future. I do talk a little bit about quantum physics because I love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I even go into a little bit of tapping, somatic breath work, healing, things that I think will give people some real tools that they can use, some resources that they can use, gratitude journals, how to you know, because it, it, to me, it's a holistic approach as well. So I think it's going to be really, really helpful for a lot of people. And for our <laughs> listeners, I can see the pride on Rebecca's face. <laughs> and I also find it interesting that early on, you were like, you're like, oh, I'm not sure if we should go there with the whole, you know, manifestation and stuff. Because um, one of the most transformative books for me that I've read probably in the last few years was uh, Psycho Cybernetics, which mm. was, uh, I don't know if you've read it or not. No. Um, it was a book written in the early 60s by a plastic surgeon who uh, went, uh, and I think he was an American plastic surgeon who trained in Germany during the Second World War. And 
was doing a lot of constructive surgery and reconstructive surgery for soldiers or for wounded um, individuals, but then came back to the States, private practice, and noticed people would come in with with a terrible amount of, um, you know, they would they would feel lost, they would feel hopeless, they would feel depressed, you know, maybe their nose is too big, maybe their ears are too big, something happened. And so he would do corrective surgery and he noticed that half of the people who worked through it came back with completely different personalities, completely different outlook, different personalities, their lives had completely changed and others hadn't. And he couldn't figure out why. So he started digging into it. But a lot of the stuff that a lot of the stuff that that we talk about today, a lot of the stuff that Jim Rohn, uh, Tony Robbins is, um, you know, mentor and a lot of the stuff that's been built today that we speak about around manifestation. These are like some early stuff from the 60s. And the reason it's called psycho-cybernetics was because the the only technology or language they had at the time were were like robotic servers. And so it's kind of weird to read this book from the 60s. And, you know, it's written by uh, uh, like by a doctor who's a Christian. It's written from a very male point of view. It talks about housewives and all this stuff, which you oh. have to account for the time. But but the foundational work is 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 there. And my one takeaway from it is if you have a clear goal, as you said, you have a clear goal, you have a f- clear vision of what could happen or who you could be or, or, or who you could become, and you're not quite sure how to get there, it doesn't matter. Because if you have the energy, if you have the vision, and if you take action forward, just like a missile, this is his terminology, just like a missile that's shot, the wind is going to buff it to the left and it's going to go up and down and things are going to get its way and it's going to constantly readjust as it runs into each little roadblock along the way until it finally hits its destination. And uh, and so I, I love the things that you're talking about. And I think that there's a lot of power in that because the because as I dig into people like you who come on and say, let's talk about negotiation, but mindset is a huge key part of this. Or let's talk about uh, this part of performance or this part of business or this part of things. It just keeps coming back to like, there's actions, there's steps, there's strategies, but mindset is a big part of it. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying. You know, a lot of times people will say, I just need a good lawyer. I just, just give me the name of a good lawyer. And I'm like, okay, that's true. But no one can help you if you don't believe that you can win. Because again, you're giving away your power. Stop giving away your power. You have to believe it. And of course, I think you also have um, like there's a course or there's an offer, there's some extra bonuses. Uh, So you can go to Amazon, you get the book, but there's also a better place to get it. Yes. So if you go to slaythebully.com, there are several bonuses. We have a free masterclass, a free workbook. You get access to my private launch team. So I definitely, it's for a limited time. So I would definitely go to slaythebully.com. You can get actually even early access to the manuscript there too. I love it. And so Rebecca, thank you so much. Last question for you though. At the end of the day, for you personally, what does it all come down to? Uh, It just comes down to knowing who you are in an authentic way. Because once you know who you are, I truly believe that we are meant to serve our soul to God's highest purpose. If we're not doing that, it's almost disrespectful to God that we were born to serve God at at the highest level. And we were, we are all unique. And we were all meant to shine. And I want to help people do that. And I know that I am simply the vessel for that. And I'm just grateful to be chosen to be this voice on behalf of the voiceless. I feel that that is my, 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 my purpose. I was bullied as a child for being Asian. And I feel like everything has been a confluence of events for all the way up through now. 